fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver, the Lone Ranger. Faithful Indian companion Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. Colonel Mark Belton, who had won the Army nickname of Old Iron Pants from his hard-riding campaigns against hostile Indians, pointed out a map which hung in his headquarters at Fort Reynolds. He was saying... Captain Woods, we'll proceed west by southwest from the fort... Following the old Comanche Trail through Ten Sleep Pass. Well, that is the most direct line of march, sir, but... But uh, what? It'll take us through the Comanche's reservation. And under the terms of the existing treaty, no soldiers are to put foot there as long as the Indians remain peaceable. It blazes with a treaty. I don't intend to go three or four hundred miles out of the way just to observe those idiotic peace terms. Yes, come. Major Hatfield's compliments. Sir. Yes, yes, Sergeant Rue. What have you to report? Eight new men just arrived at the fort under the charge of Corporal Mark Smith, sir. Yeah. What are they like? Uh, four are immigrants, sir. They can't speak English. Three talk and act as though they'd been recruited from the Dead Rabbit Gang in New York. Yes. Corporal Smith is the only soldier among them. Yes, he probably enlisted under an alias. Well, bring the squad around where I can inspect it from the window. And assign them into Company's K&L. Yes, sir. Colonel, do you really mean to take those rookies on the march to Fort Greystone? Indeed I do. I'll make them break them in a hurry. Bobby! Right, right! Up! There they are, sir. Yeah. They look like the slats in an old picket fence. Right, ho! Right, hey! New corporal knows squad drill and carries himself smartly. He has an it... intelligent face. No. Oh. No, it can't be. Colonel, you're real. Let me steady you. Stand aside, Captain Wilson. Why are you staring at Corporal Smith? Smith. Smith. That man is Mark Belton, Jr., my only son. Your son, sir? And he's in the ranks? The lily-livered coward should be in the dishonored grave from which President Lincoln spared him. Colonel, if you'll excuse me. No, Captain, stay and hear me. This is something of which I must relieve my mind. Very well, sir. That craven poltroon out there was in my command during the closing months of the Civil War. I had hoped to send him to West Point, but he enlisted under me against my wishes. I see. At his first sight of the Confederate cavalry, he turned his horse and fled from the field. He must have been very young at the time. He was 16. 
But his youth was no excuse for his cowardice. Drummer boys of 12 and 13 often distinguish themselves by their valor. Well, I was very much afraid the first time I went under fire. You didn't turn tail, but he did. Because I always felt that I was a father of every man in the regiment, I treated him as I would any other soldier. That was your duty. Mark Belton Jr. was court-martialed and justly sentenced to death. But the president pardoned him. What happened then, sir? He was given a bobtail discharge. Colonel, your son is five years older now. Perhaps he re-enlisted under a false name because he has found his courage and hopes to redeem his honor. I'd like to think so. But no, once a coward, always a coward. What do you propose to do with him now? I'll reveal his true identity. Even though it means that his vile record and my relationship to him become known to every soldier on the frontier... I'll have him drummed out of the fort. I understand your feeling, Colonel Belton. But I'd like to give the boy a chance. Yeah? You want to become the foster father of the shameful creature I disown? Is that it? You may say so. Then he is your responsibility. Now pass the word that we march at dawn. It was late on the following afternoon when Colonel Belton's cavalrymen and field wagons reached Ten Sleep Pass. The colonel's son rode in the advance guard under the direct command of Captain Wilkes. He kept to himself until the captain called him to one side. They are riding stirrup to stirrup. The commissioned officer and corporal were able to talk without being overheard by the others. Tugging at his horseshoe-shaped mustache, the captain said, Young man, your father recognized you yesterday. I know it, sir. I saw him looking through the window at headquarters. He told me what happened during the Civil War. Why are you here? I was assigned to his command by accident. But I'm glad now that we're together again. He doesn't share that feeling. I'll make him proud of me yet, I swear it. Captain, believe me, I didn't desert in the face of the enemy. I'll admit I was scared, but I didn't weep. What happened? The horse I rode into the fight was a remount. It had never been under fire before and bolted at the first volley from the enemy. I lost the reins. The horse carried me to the rear before I was able to get it under control again. Was that your defense at your court-martial? Yes, sir. But it carried no weight. The advocate sneered and said that it was as much a crime for a cavalryman to let his horse run away as to run away himself. Corporal? Hey, look up ahead, sir. Mask man. There's an Indian with him. Sergeant Drew, ride back and get the colonel while we capture that pair. Yes, sir. Detachment, raw revolvers, at the gallop, forward, go! Mass man and the Indian have reined up. Up with your hands, you two. Our hands are up. Troop, ho! Oh, ho, 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 ho. Easy, easy. Keep your guns on the men. Captain, there's no need for that. We're friends. You look like outlaws to me. Why are you wearing a mask? Before we go into that, I'd like to make a report to the officer in command. Here he comes now, Colonel Belton. Kimosabe. Yes. Him, Colonel, soldiers call Old Iron Pants. Yes, I've heard of him. Really? Oh, 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 oh. Every which, who is his mess, man? I don't know, sir, but he says he has something to report. Well, be see. Colonel, you violated the Comanche Treaty. What of it? While riding along the edge of the reservation, my friend and I noticed looking glass and smoke signals in the mountains. We investigated. Yes? We found that Comanche scouts were watching your column and calling the tribe together. Right now, Chief Kwan is moving against you. You had better turn back. I want no advice from a mass civilian. There is a silver bullet, sir. It may identify me. They recognize men only by their uniforms, insignia, and honors. May I have the captain's permission to speak to the colonel, sir? Certainly, Corporal. Colonel Belton, sir. I served under General Miles before I was transferred to your command. Oh, did you, Corporal Smith? Yes, sir. During the Sioux War, a masked man saved my company from an Indian trap. He, too, used silver bullets in his cartridges. Rode a white stallion and had an Indian friend. I've heard of that incident, Colonel. It's only another barrack room legend. The idea that the army has a champion in the person of a masked man must have been born from the wishful thinking of cowards and shirkers. Colonel, you may be going to your death with your command. Then I'll die as a soldier. Now clear out of this pass or I'll have my men arrest you and strip that mask from your face. Very well, sir. Let's go, Tonto. Monsieur, come on, scout. Captain, 
resume your duties. Detachment at the trap. Word. Oh. <laughs> As the column continued its march, the Lone Ranger and Tonto raced on ahead of the advance guard. Soon they reached a broad valley from which they had entered the pass after discovering that there were soldiers in it. Out of the dead vegetation which stood shoulder high in some parts of the lowlands, a score of painted warriors suddenly rose and blocked their way. Only two had firearms. They discharged their weapons wildly. The others let loose a flight of arrows. One iron-tipped shaft struck the cantle of the Lone Ranger's saddle, embedding itself in the leather-covered wood. Disregarding it, he brought Silver around in a tight half-circle and headed him away from the Indians and toward the heights overlooking the pass. Follow me, Tonto! Mon Silver! I Tonto! Get him out! Scout! At that moment, a horde of mounted Comanches swept down into the valley from the opposite slope. Turning, the Lone Ranger triggered a gun three times. <laughs> He hoped not only to warn the soldiers, but to entice the Indians into a chase. But Chief Juana's braves refused the bait. They rode on into the pass as the masked man and his friend reached the top of a cliff and drew rein. Toto pointed toward the other end of Ten Sleep Pass. Look, Kimasabi. Plenty more Indian there. And ride in on soldier from behind. Soldiers in the rear guard see them. They open fire. And what we do? We can serve the troops best by staying here. Only one Indian out of ten has a rifle. Their arrows would be deadly if they shot down into the pass from these cliffs. Isn't that right? We we'll use these rocks for cover and fight any attempt the Comanches make to flank the column and gain the high ground. Get out your Winchester. As the Lone Ranger and Tonto yanked repeating rifles from saddle scabbards and unrolled the oiled silk in which they had been wrapped for greater protection against dust and dampness, the wagon train and escorting troops came to a halt. <laughs> Captain Wilkes was shouting, Colonel, there are hundreds of Indians at the mouth of the pass ahead of us. Yes, in the back. There are just as many behind us at the other end of the pass. They're staying out of rifle range. Perhaps we should charge them. No, no. I think that's what they want us to do. They appear to outnumber us ten to one. We have stay in the center of the pass where they can't surround us. We have barricade the pass at both ends of the column. Cavalry, dismount! Horses and horse holders to the center of the column! Wagoners, set up a barricade! As the cavalrymen in the advance and rear guards dismounted, the mule skinners built walls of wagons, boxes, and barrels across the pass at both ends of the column, providing the troopers with protection against the Indians' arrows. Then the colonel hurried from the front of the wagon train to inspect the defenses at the opposite end of the canyon. Meanwhile, Chief Quana had hit upon the idea of shooting down into the cavalry column from the bluffs, which rose to a great height on both sides of the pass. The chief saw that any Indians who followed the paths, which led directly to the tops of the bluffs, would be exposed to the fire of the soldiers at close range. So he sent a small party with bows and arrows to hunt a safe way to reach the high ground. From their place of concealment, the Lone Ranger and Tonto watched the warriors steal upward toward them by a route which was hidden from the cavalrymen. As they leveled their Winchesters, the masked man said, Tonto, we'll try to drive them back without killing any of them. Command Chief, plenty close now. All right, open fire. Taken by surprise in that exposed position, most of the Indians broke and fled at once. But two young warriors came on, apparently believing that the misdirected shots were being fired by poor marksmen. Better we shoot. Wound them, fella. No, on your feet. As the Lone Ranger and Tonto scrambled to their feet, the braves sprang over the barricade. One drove a knife at Tonto, while the other swung a war club, aiming a skull-crushing blow at the masked man's head. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
Now to continue. Colonel Belton's cavalry column had been trapped in Ten Sleep Pass by Chief Quanna, the Comanche, and his braves. On a cliff overlooking the battlefield, the Lone Ranger and Tottle fought hand-to-hand with two warriors who had tried to get above the soldiers. As one of them struck with a war club, the masked man raised his rifle with both hands, protecting his head. The blow fell on the barrel of the Winchester, knocking it from the Lone Ranger's grasp. The Comanche straightened and tried to raise the spike-studded club again. Oh, you don't! Catching hold of the Indian's war club with his left hand, the Lone Ranger brought his right fist up from his knee. His knuckles smashed into the warrior's painted face. All right! The Comanche let go of his murderous weapon and staggered back. Before he could recover, the masked man sprang upon him and stripped him of the knife, bow, and arrow-filled quiver which he carried. In the meantime, Tonto had succeeded in disarming the other brave. He pushed his prisoner forward. What? What we do with them? Say that they are free to go. Alma, Sakula. Still silent, the two beaten warriors strode away without a backward glance. Sun going down. What do you think Indians do? I don't know, Kimasabi. Chief Kwana has a lot of fighting men. He'd overwhelm the cavalry by sheer weight of numbers if he chose. Him like to save warriors' lives. It's happening down in the pass. Look, soldier leave fire in line. Yes, I see him. He's trying to reach a wounded man who lies between the Indians and the troops. Now Comanche slip out from other side. The Indian is also trying to reach the wounded soldier. Him carry cool stick. If him finish off wounded soldier and touch him with stick, it count as victory for him. He and the soldier who left the line now see each other. Better we shoot Comanche. No, both sides have quit firing. Each wants its man to have a fair chance. Sometimes Indian chiefs fight like that in wars between tribes. Otto, that soldier is wearing two yellow chevrons. He's a corporal who knew about me. Him crawl through rocks now. Him close to Indian. The Comanche has the advantage because the corporal is trying to protect his wounded comrade. Neither the Indian nor the corporal is in a position to fire effectively. Now there's only one big stone between them. The Comanche is going to fire through a crevice in the rock. Corporal hit and fall flat. Drop rifle. The Indian is rushing him with a knife. Now Corporal go on one knee and draw a revolver. And they're fighting hand to hand. Corporal hold Indian's knife hand. Indian grab gun. The Indian is down. Maybe other Comanche shoot Corporal now. No, I doubt it. Chief Quanah has a high sense of honor and respects courage. Look, Corporal pick up other wounded man and stagger back to army line with him. The Indians at this end of the pass aren't raising a hand to stop him. Him safe now. Other soldiers help other fellas through line. A lull followed the single-handed combat between the lines. But the Comanches continued to block both ends of the pass in great force, pinning the cavalrymen to their defensive position. As night began to close in on the beleaguered soldiers, Colonel Belton, who had been directing operations at the rear of the column, turned his horse back toward Captain Wilkes' company. Near a dressing station, which the regimental surgeon had set up among the wagons, he came upon his son. He drew rein. What are you doing here, Corporal Smith? I'm going to the dressing station, sir. Don't tell me that you have been honestly wounded. No, it isn't much, sir. Just my shoulder. Here, let me see it. Yes, sir. Yeah, there are powder burns on your blouse. The muzzle of the gun that fired a bullet into your shoulder wasn't far from you. No, sir. You weren't shot by an Indian. Now he's been close to our lines. I can explain No that. doubt, no doubt. You blamed a horse once for your desertion on the field of action? Now I suppose a horse shot you. Colonel, I... That's can't... a self-inflicted wound. You wounded yourself to escape the danger on the firing line. Well, it's my duty to shoot you where you stand. Please listen, Father. Don't call me Father. You're no son of mine, Corporal Smith. Oh, I know it's useless to try to talk to you. But Captain Wilkes knows the truth. Ask him how I received that wound. Wilkes is soft. Now say your prayers. God forgive you. Go on and shoot. No. No, I can't do it. I can't. But there's another way. I've ejected five of the six cartridges in this revolver. Now, take it. Go. As young Mark Belton accepted the gun, he looked steadily into his father's grim face. I understand, sir. You expect me to die by my own hand? 
Or at the hands of the Comanches. The choice is yours. Go. Yes, sir. Standing stiffly erect, the corporal saluted the colonel, then made an about face and marched off toward the shadowy cliffs. For many minutes, Colonel Belton stood motionless beside his horse, straining his ears for a single gunshot or a triumphant howl from the Indians. Then hoofs drummed toward him from the front line. Colonel Belton, is that you? Yes, Captain Will. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> what have you to report? All's quiet now at the upper end of the pass. Have you seen your son? I have no son. And you don't know? No what? While you were at the rear of the column, your boy rescued Sergeant Drew. What? The sergeant had been wounded and left behind when the advance guard was forced back. I don't believe it. It's the truth, sir. I saw what he did. In order to reach the sergeant, he had to meet one of Quanah's braves in single combat. Captain Wilkes. What's the matter, Colonel? I murdered my son. My son. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger and Tonto had continued their watch on top of the cliff. The masked man was saying, Listen, Tonto, someone is climbing up the cliff. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Got boots on. Must be soldier. That's a corporal who knew about me. Come over here, corporal. What? We're friends. It's you, mister. Yes, my friend and I have been guarding the high ground. I hoped I'd find you. What are you doing here? I was ordered out of the lines. This is what happened. After hearing the corporal's story, the Lone Ranger bandaged his wound and supplied him with a handful of cartridges. You may need them before the night is over. I'm ready to use them now. No matter what my father did to me, I want to save him and the men in his command. I understand. Tonto, you better scout around the mouth of the pass. Indian, plenty quiet there. That's just it. When Comanches are quiet, they're more than ever dangerous. Ah, let me find out what to do. A half hour later, Tonto was back with news that all of the Indians had withdrawn from the end of the pass to the slopes of the valley beyond and appeared to be ready to ride at a moment's notice. The corporal was excited. Now the troops can get out of the trap and fight in the open. I'll go back No, and wait, corporal. Tonto, do you hear that noise? Ah, uh, me here. Plenty of cattle come this way. Cattle don't move at night unless they're driven. Who'd be driving them? The Indians. They've rounded up several thousand head of cattle which the government recently sent to the reservation for food. What good will the cattle do them in a fight? One of Kwana's favorite tricks is to make an attack behind a screen of cattle. You'll have the herd stampeded into the pass. Well, if that happens... Then your father's command will be wiped out to the last man. Into the saddle, Toto. Corporal, now behind me. Steady, right, Silver. Easy, 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 easy. What we do? Go to the mouth of the pass. I have a plan. Come on, Silver. Up, Silver. As Silver and Scout bore their riders down from the cliff, the Comanche's cattle drive neared the entrance to Ten Sleep Pass. The Indians, who had been waiting on the slopes of the valley, converged on the flanks and rear of the herd. Shooting, yelling, and waving blankets, Kwana's warriors spread terror through the herd. In bellowing panic, the longhorns fled before them, heads tossing, hoofs trampling down the tall grass and brush. The stampeding cattle and their savage drivers were a half mile away when the masked man and his friends reached the low ground. He was shouting, We'll fire the grass ahead of the herd. And let me down. I'll put a match to it. We haven't time to stop. Otto, use your canteen to wet the loop end of your lariat. Then wad up the oil silk you had around your rifle and attach the rope to it. Uh, he's heavy. I'll do the same. Without slackening the speed of their horses, the lone ranger and his Indian companion made the preparation which he had ordered. Then they touched matches to the balls of cloth and trailed them along behind through the tinder dry vegetation. Soon, two trails of fire marked their course. The corporal looked back. The grass is blazing halfway across the valley. Fire running cattle. The herd is gaining on us. Faster, Silver, faster. Get him up, Scout. Then the sudden gust of wind whipped out of the pass into the bottleneck of the valley, fanning the blazing grass. The twin lines of fire mounted, overlapped, and became a high wall of flame which raced back toward the onrushing cattle. Look, the herd is splitting. Some cattle turn back. Some head for high ground. The engines are riding for their lives. Pull up. Pull up. Oh, oh, oh. Easy, steady, big fella. It'll be a long time before Quanah can reorganize his warriors. Now yeah, you've won, mister. The troops can move out of the pass now. Some come out now. That's yes, the advance guard. There's Captain Wilkes and my father. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Colonel, they're the masked man with Indian friends. He has a soldier on his horse. I'll get down now, mister. <coughs> Mark! Mark, my boy. I, I thought May you... I have the captain's permission to speak to the colonel, sir? Permission? 
sir. From now on, nothing will stand between us. I'm as proud of what you did today as I am sorry for what I did. Sir, I... I only tried to live up to the name I bear. Now it's for me to try to live up to your name. Give me your hands, son. As the Mark Belton, senior and junior, colonel and corporal shook hands, and tears melted from the battle-hardened eyes of old Iron Pants. Captain Wilkes turned to the Lone Ranger. Mister, we were watching from the mouth of the pass when you set the fire that saved us. You were three against thousands. Captain, we wanted to save both the troops and Comanches. Even though the Indians were in the right, a victory over your cavalry would have led to their destruction by other soldiers. This trouble could have been avoided by respecting Kwana's treaty rights. Yes, that's true, Mr. I admit that I was wrong. Wrong about my, my son, wrong about the Indians, and wrong about you. If I had followed your advice... It's not too late to turn back out of the reservation. Are there any Comanches behind your column now? No, none, sir. I just received a report that all the Indians at the rear disappeared after the fire started. We'll move off the Indian lands at once. The fire will burn out as soon as it sweeps the valley. Little has been lost in the action at Ten Sleep Pass. I hope that much has been gained. Adios, gentlemen. Adios, sir. Father. Yes, sir. Here's your revolver. You'll find silver bullets in the chambers you unloaded. Silver bullets, Mark? What do they mean? They mean that all of us owe our lives to the Lone Ranger. This is a feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated, created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Brace Beamer.